Hello, everybody. This is Anthony for Investors Undergrounds. Today, it's a pleasure for me to get to conduct an interview with Tim Gratani. Tim is a phenomenal trader who managed to turn $1,500 into over $2.7 million at the start of his trading career. He's gone on to surpass $12 million in trading profits. Tim has a long history of sharing his inspiring trading journey and knowledge with others. He's been interviewed on several television shows, documented his trades on his blog and his YouTube channel, and he's even created a couple excellent trading DVDs. He's been profiled in the book Momo Traders and is a multi-year sponsor of Traders for a Cause. You can follow him on Twitter at CroyRunner89. Hello, Tim. Thank you for being here and taking the time to speak with me today. Hey, it's good to be here. Thank you so much for having me on. Tim, it's incredible to think the original interview that you did with Cam for Investors Underground was published about eight and a half years ago. And I know a lot of traders out there, myself included, gained a lot of knowledge from that interview. So thank you for that. A lot has happened in that amount of time. Oh, yeah, of course. And yeah, a lot has changed since then. It's definitely time to catch up again. I know it might be a little bit redundant, but I would love to start by just asking you, you know, how you first got interested in the stock market and trading. You know, my, my background was that I kind of just feel like I sort of sleepwalked through school. Like I'd never really found anything that captured my interest or attention that much. And I was just kind of going through the motions. So I was nearing the end of my finance degree in college and I was like, what am I going to do with this? Because I, I do not like the kind of direction that the degree seems like it pushes you, which is like either accounting or financial planning. And like, yeah, that just did not appeal. And because I was kind of like not the best student, not too motivated, I, I hadn't really explored job options too much even. Like I, I had had a reliable steady summer job at a state farm which you know it was it was good work and like it was cool because they would like send me out of the office for like an hour a day to like take photos of houses and stuff but um it was definitely not what i wanted to be doing so i was kind of just like reached this point where i was like okay like what it all applies that i can you know that i can find something i'm happy with and uh, the idea of day trading kind of jumped out because it was you know it there was a lot more action, you know, like it, it like every day there's, there's adrenaline of some sort. And uh, I, I had been really into poker and then sports betting and stuff like that. So, you know, stock market kind of seemed like growing up gambling. So I, I was uh, I was very much drawn to that idea. And I just kind of tried to dive in by myself and get a little experience. And just, you know, the, the end goal was let's sound competent in some kind of trading job interview. Interesting. So yeah, were you thinking about going and trading maybe for a firm or something like that rather than be a retail trader? Yeah, I think that was the vision originally. Um, I, I, you know, as I got into the retail trading side of things and then, you know, I, I found, I found Tim Sykes originally, I found Nate. Um, I, I guess the more I studied and the more I did it myself, I, I, I the seed kind of got planted like, oh, hey, I could do this on my own. But it took a while for me to really believe in that vision because I struggled initially. It was, you know, it was nine months before I was profitable. So um, that that was a bit of a journey to go on. And thank goodness I was trading so small at the time. How did you learn how to trade? What were some of the resources that had the biggest impact on you? And um, what were some of the biggest challenges for you? Like, what were some of your weaknesses as a trader when you first started? Yeah. So, so I mentioned Tim and Nate, um, you know, each kind of played their own role in my success um, with their content. Um, at the time, Nate, he did free scans for Investors Underground. Um, so I, I think the main thing I took from Nate um, at the time was um, I, I was really focused on pump and dumps back when I first started. Um, that, that whole side of the market was really interesting to me. Like I, I heard about them in a, like a Tim Sykes marketing video where he was like explaining the mechanics of a pump and dump. And I was like, this is crazy. Like, how could this not be predictable? And uh, I think I had a crude understanding of it because, you know, my, my thought of what is a pump and dump is, oh, like they, you know, they send out emails, they're promoting the stock that makes it go up. And then at the very end, that's when they sell. And that really wasn't accurate because, you know, I'd read Nate's scans and I would see Nate 
talking about whatever the current hot pump was and you'd be saying like, oh, they have really good control of the action. Oh, they really supported the bid today. Or uh, you know, he, like, you know, it sounded like an ongoing story and that kind of opened my eyes a lot further. I was like, wait, okay, this isn't just rigged. This is like really rigged. Like they, they're controlling it every step of the way and they're dumping the whole way. Um, so I, I really, really got a lot of the psychology side of Nate. And uh, then, you know, just kind of basic, basic patterns initially from Tim, where it was um, like one, one of his DVDs, I think it was a second penny stocking DVD where he was like running through like multi-day breakout charts. And I was like, I like this pattern. This makes sense to me. Um, now you asked about some of my struggles. Like I, I definitely struggled with the idea early on, you know, it, it's presented like, oh, you know, resistance turns into support after the breakout. And I expected that perfect to the penny. So, you know, if I'm buying a breakout at a dollar, if the stock breaks below a dollar, I'm, I'm like, oh my gosh, like it, that that's it. Like it's dead. It was a fake breakout. And then, you know, a day later it's at two and I'm just feeling dumb. So uh, it, it took a little while to get through that idea that resistance and support, they don't act perfectly. You know, it's more like general areas. And um, what kind of took things to the next level for me was when I started tracking stuff on my own in spreadsheets where I, I would take the breakout and I'd say, okay, here's where the breakout was. Uh, here's what time it happened. Here's how low it got after. Here's how high it got after. And uh, then I could really see, you know, through a number of samples in the sheet, like, oh, okay, you know, if it dips 5% below the breakout level, that really isn't that bad. Like that, that's almost to be expected. So maybe I need to adjust my plan where that move isn't shaking me out. And that was really the start of me starting to find a little consistency. And uh, then it was just kind of off and running from there. So you were doing your own sort of performance tracking and, and data collection on your side as well, even in the in the early days. Um, were you using like Excel or, or were you taking screenshots of some of the charts as well? Like how in-depth was that, that sort of tracking um, and, and how did that really help you get you to the next level? Um, it's, it's funny because if I were to look at it now, I would say, okay, it definitely wasn't sufficient, but it, uh, it still served a purpose. Like it's not, it's not like you have to, you know, go nuts and put in six hours a day of Excel and saving charts, like anything helps. Like it definitely benefited me. And I was probably closer to an hour a day of the work on my own. Um, I mean, yeah, I was tracking my own trades. Um, one of the first things that kind of like, you know, I'm tracking my trades and I'm seeing the results and I'm saying like, wait, this isn't as easy as it looked, you know, like I was trying to follow alerts too. So that was part of it. But, um, but yeah, like just to see it on paper, like, okay, wait, like, why did I take like an 8% loss here? Like that, that, that doesn't really make sense. Cause you know, the guru just took like a 3% gain. <laughs> But then, yeah, I was, um, you know, when I'm, when I'm logging these pumps or like the breakouts, I was definitely saving the charts as well. Usually just like, I mean, depending on the time frame. like if it was a breakout from two or three days ago, I'd probably try to get all three or four of those days in, um, into one chart and, you know, save it as like a five minute chart type situation. Um, but there, there weren't that many big pumps back then. Like, I, I think it was maybe like starting to cool off a little bit around the time I started where, you know, every month there were probably about three big announcements. So I, I wasn't too slammed with, um, you know, having to save dozens of charts a day. It was more like, okay, out of the few main pumps that are in play today, like how many were new announcements, how many had big breakouts and, you know, then just, you know, snap a couple of charts a day and uh, make sure you get the entries in the spreadsheet. And is it safe to say that if you weren't doing that type of analysis and, and tracking, that it possibly could have set you back um, or made rather the learning curve a, a little bit longer? Oh, I think so for sure. Um, because I, like I said, it was, it was such an aha moment to like see it on the spreadsheet. They, you know, breakouts don't hold perfectly. And uh, I, I think I would have gotten there eventually, but um, it, it sped the process up for sure. And especially, you know, I, I was on a bit of a timeline early on because you know, I'm running out of days that I'm in college and then I'm, supposed to hit the real world so it was like i really need to figure this stuff out sooner rather than later yeah yeah and i know you you know had started out with a modest amount of money that you had saved up you know working co college jobs um, or summer jobs rather and, and so how were you able to avoid the pattern day trader rule during those early days yeah and it wasn't it wasn't totally avoided um i i was fortunate that i eventually kind of lobbied my parents on board with the whole idea 
Um, so I, you know, I was able to approach them and say like, okay, you know, the pattern day trader thing is a huge obstacle. Like I only have $1,500 for my account. That means three day trades a week. Like I really feel like I need more than that. So like we worked something out where they, they loaned me some money to open two additional brokerage accounts, but the agreement was like, I'm never actually betting their money. So it's, it's like, I'm never going above a $1,500 position. Like if I lose the $1,500, that's it. Like, it doesn't matter that there's still $10,000 between my three accounts. Like that's their money. I'm not touching it. So, so their money was more there so that I could have more brokerage accounts open and, you know, get nine day trades a week instead of three. And then it was just up to me to, you know, kind of maintain my word and uh, make sure I'm not dipping into their money. Yeah. That's interesting. And I, I think you have very understanding and supportive parents to, to do that for you and be willing Absolutely. To, to, to do that. Any advice for anybody out there uh, thinking of doing something similar, maybe some words of caution that, you know, having done that yourself? Yeah. I mean, looking back at it now, I definitely didn't need nine trades a week. Uh, I was over trading quite a bit. So, and I think that'd probably be true for most traders um, who are just starting out. Uh, there's nothing wrong with trying a lot of things and trying to figure out, you know, what works for you and what kind of trades you're comfortable in. Um, but yeah, like with the, the day trader rule is tough. Like you, you need to, uh, if you can split your money between two, three brokers, definitely go for it. Um, but I, I really think that early on the mentality needs to be more, let's try some things and figure out what I'm doing and keep the size really small and really recoverable. Um, and I, I, you know, I kind of was forced into that because I didn't have a lot of money and I'm so glad I was, because like I said, I eventually blew up that first 1500. And I think if I had had more money, I absolutely would have been trying to go bigger. Like it's very hard, especially when you're first starting trading, not to be really excited and saying like, oh, I'm gonna make all this money so fast. Um, so yeah, early, early on, I think, uh, especially when you're under pattern day trader, uh, keep, keep that size small, you know, go, go against, go against the temptation to uh, make a lot fast. I think that's great advice. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. And I, I know that you traded OTC stocks, uh, early on in your career. And so I was wondering, you know, what first got you interested in OTC stocks? And do you have any advice for anybody currently who trades OTCs or thinking about trading OTCs? Yeah, so, so the OTCs early on were really where most of those blatant pumps happened. Um, and, I, you know, I, I kind of, um, I missed the name earlier when I was mentioning early influences on my trading. Um, Michael Good was huge um, because he was, he was the moderator in Tim's room. And uh, the, really the, you know, breakouts were one of my main OTC patterns for the pumps, but the new announcements were really what drove that fast account growth early on, where it was, you know, th these big promoters, when they put out their first email, you know, announcing a new pick, you could get a 100% move in 10 minutes. Like it was, it was absolutely nuts. And so Michael Good, like he was, he was so generous with his knowledge um, because I, I would watch him in the chat room whenever one of these were announced and he would catch it like almost every time. And I tried a couple on my own early on and I wasn't getting fills and I was getting the email way late and I couldn't figure out what was going wrong. So, you know, I, I was pestering him with a lot of questions like, Hey, how did you get that email so fast? Or, Hey, how did you get that fill? And, uh, you know, he, he shared it all with me very openly. And, um, I mean, especially knowing what I know now, like I really appreciate that because, he, in a sense, was giving away some of his edge. Like there's only so many early fills on an announcement like that. I mean, I, I may have been taking some of his shares, you know, once I started realizing like how to directly route to, you know, different market makers on Speed Trader or, uh, you know, how to sign up. You know, I, I made like maybe like 20 burner email accounts and I signed them all up like at different times to all these main pump websites because they would stagger their emails. So I just had to make sure that one of these 20 email accounts would get one of the first alerts. Usually I was able to do that. Um, so, and, and so I owe a lot of that to, to good. When you, we do come across a trader that's willing to share some of their, their knowledge, it's, it's always really tremendous to see. And I think um, there have been quite a few really open traders uh, like that. And uh, those, those individuals are always really, really a valuable part of the community. So kudos to them and, and thank them. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and the OTC markets kind of had a, a bit of a resurgence in, in 2020. I was wondering if you 
were trading some of some of those names. Right. Yeah. So yeah, OTC. Um, it, it's definitely had its ups and downs. Um, since my early days. Um, there there was definitely a period in there. You're right. Like it was totally dead, and uh, a lot of the volume left. And when that resurgence came in 2020, I, I definitely caught a bit of it. Um, early in 2020. Um, you know, I, I think we're going to get to this a little bit later, but I have not been too active the past couple of years in my trading. So a lot of the OTC action, I wasn't really a part of because I just wasn't actively at my desk. Um, I actually, I actually just came back a few weeks ago to trade one. Uh, I can't remember the ticker now, but I think it was one of those ones where in a few days, it was like two bucks to nine bucks or something like that. And it actually had tradable volume. So I, um, I wound up uh, shorting that one morning and capturing a bit of that downside. So that was fun. Um, but yeah, you know, with, with the OTC market, um, it, it is one of those things where there will be times where it's very active and it's fantastic to know how to trade it because I think it's some of the easiest money in the market. Um, but you can't just rely solely on that because there are also those totally dead periods where, you know, there's just like, you've got nothing to do. Absolutely. And I definitely want to touch on some of the the more recent uh, changes in your trading a, a little bit later. But one of the the big topics that I wanted to talk to you about was scaling up um, and mm -hmm. going from you know a smaller account to obviously you had quite a bit of success. And so, what was the process like uh, for you scaling up your account? You know, when did you know that it was right for you to start scaling up, and what did that look like for you? Yeah, um, it, I tried to think about this one a little bit for early in my career. And if I'm being really honest about it, I don't think I had a great methodology to it early in my career. Um, it just kind of happened naturally. I didn't really think about it too much. Um, the, the only time I really remember thinking about it was after my first big win on an OTC pump, where I actually decided not to like start pushing too hard, where I was like, oh, wow, like I'm finally profitable. I need to protect. Like, I need to be careful. Um, but then somewhere along the way, I got more comfortable and I just kind of, I, I, like I said, I didn't really think too much about it. I was just starting to push size a little bit. And I think that kind of led to some of my trouble down the road because I wasn't so much that risk first mentality. And then I went through, you know, this series of six string losses uh, in the, or six figure losses in the middle of my uh, career. Um, you know, the worst being 290 K on Lake in, I want to say that was 2014. Um, so that was like three months of work gone in one trade. Um, but it, it was, um, it was very psychologically damaging to have it keep happening again and again and again. And that's when I said, okay, I really do need to start thinking more about risk and uh, risk first mentality. And that's where I got methodical about it because first of all, I, I forced myself to size way down and, uh, sizing way down for me was, okay, I'm going to go into every single trade saying that if I'm wrong on this trade, if I have to stop out at my stop point, I'm not going to lose more than a thousand dollars. And then it was just kind of testing myself every month, you know, logging my mistakes, not my losses, but my mistakes, some trades, they're just not going to work, but if it becomes a mistake, if you traded it with too much size, or if you got stubborn, or if you started adding as it was going against, you know, those were things I counted as a mistake. So I would tally my mistakes every month. And if I, you know, just to hold myself accountable. And if I had a good month where I did not make many mistakes, then I could, I could size up a little bit the next month. And I was just taking $500. So I went from, you know, a thousand to 1500, 1500 to 2000. And uh, sometimes these little jumps in risk size would kind of lead to some sloppy habits where, you know, like, the, especially in the first week of the change, it would be like, Oh, I just went from 1500 to $2,000 risk. And now I don't want to take losers. And then I'd have a string of stubborn losses and I'd say, okay, well, this month was not really my best in terms of discipline. So, you know, next month I'm still staying at $2,000 risk. And so I, I just did it a little at a time, $500 at a time. And then I think around the time I got to about 5k risk, um, I was feeling pretty good about where I was at and I stopped tracking it that meticulously. Um, I, I wound up landing at about $10,000 risk per trade it was about my normal size. Um, there would be the occasional trade where I'd let myself go more like 20 um, if I felt like it was like an A plus opportunity. Um, but I was never one of those traders who could throw 10 times my size at something I thought was A plus. Um, that, that was just mentally too challenging for me. The idea of, oh, what if I lose on this? Because when will the next A plus be? You know, it, it just, I, I, some people can do it. I can't. Like it just, for me, it just would be the mental spiraling and really, really sloppy trading on 
whatever the setup was because I was so fearful of maybe taking that loss. Um, so I, I think I tried a couple of times to push size a little beyond the 10 K, but, um, I, I was trying to do it too fast, like go from 10 to 15 or 10 to 20. And really, I, th I think it's need to be smaller steps. Um, you know, I, I have heard of other people doing 1% of their account or something like that as their risk per trade. And I also think there's possibly um, that that could be a very good approach. Um, I think what would scare me on that approach would be if I had a really good day where, you know, maybe my account value goes up at 20%, you know, like one of those rare, crazy good days. And then all of a sudden my size goes way up with it. Um, so like may maybe I would like, would have to wire out or something because, you know, a big overnight jump like that could, I think that could mess with my head. At least I I'm sure it can mess with other people's too. Yeah, I, I can imagine the 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 changes in in P and L and those swings can can definitely have an impact on on traders. And I think it's really interesting how you mentioned that you were taking a look at what mistakes you had because I, I think a lot of traders do sort of get into this. Uh, at least I've heard people get into these sort of issues where they might have a big win, but then they have a huge loss that is a multiplier of whatever their win was. And so it sounds like the way that you approached it, and correct me if I'm wrong, was, you know, counting your mistakes. And if you sort of gave yourself like an allowance based on how well you were trading and, and how how much maybe you, you stuck with with what uh, your original plan was, let's say. Is that accurate? Yeah, it was like if I could I could maintain my discipline for a month, then, yeah, the reward was take a small step up in size because I was trying to you know, rebuild my account. Um, it, it's all about the self accountability. Like I, like one, one thing that drives me nuts is seeing people who blame external factors for their losses. You know, people saying, oh, well, there's manipulation or, oh, like, you know, the, the liquidity was too low. Like, like these are, these are, these should be known issues before you even get into the trade. Um, you, sh you should factor those things into your decision-making before you push any buttons. So like once you've pushed the button, the responsibility all completely falls on you. And so, you know, the, the problem isn't that the stock was manipulated, it's that you chose to ignore the fact that it was manipulated or you chose to adjust your plan accordingly. So I, I think that self-accountability um, really is huge, especially when trying to start pushing your size a little bit. And what were some of the technical and psychological challenges that, that you faced when you were scaling up? Um, the biggest psychological challenge, I think, was the fear of not getting a fill or slippage um, or, or you know, even being faked out. Um, no, no one likes the idea of being faked out. That, that was what most of my stubborn losers came down to was, you know, I, I'd be short something saying, oh, I'll stop out at high day and then there's high day. And, you know, the, the initial gut reaction I always seemed to go to was, oh, well, what if it's what if it's a trap for longs? What if they're what if they're just going to stuff this and slam it? And eventually I just kind of had to get to the point of acceptance where I'd say, okay, you know what, if you guys are going to fake me out, by all means, fake me out. Like, I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to worry about being ready to get back in if it is a fake out. Um, because, you know, you, you just, I, I think it takes the battle scars really uh, to get to that point where, you know, you go through enough where it's not a fake out. And then all of a sudden your loss gets way out of control and you say, what just happened? And, uh, that that gets very painful, especially when it happens again and again and again. So, I, I mean, it, it's funny because I heard all of this stuff throughout my career. Like it wasn't and none of it's a new concept to me, but it really took that pain of experiencing it to, uh, you know, solidify it. So a, a lot has changed, you know, since 2014 when you did your first interview with Investors Underground. So I just wanted to find out what has your trading life been like and what has been going on with you more generally speaking, you know, have there clearly there's been changes in the market. Um, but what are some of the changes that you've gone through um, that have maybe influenced your trading or what is your trading in general looking like these days? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that's a little complicated than answer. I mean, so I, I mean, the, the first and biggest change in my life is that I've got two kids now and they are fantastic, but um, I kind of made a conscious decision um, after our first kid and when we were talking about having our second that I wanted to back off of trading a bit. 
and be more involved with their early years. And um, also another kind of piece that went into that was that even before we had kids, I'd go through these periods of time where I'd, I'd be trading really well, but I still would be just feeling really burned out and a little unfulfilled from it, uh, if that makes any sense. And uh, so it, it kind of just made sense where it was like, okay, yeah, now it's a great time to take a step back and uh, get away from the markets a little bit and uh, be more involved in my kids' lives because, you know, you, you hear all these people, you know, like I, I, I you hear all these stories about people who like when they're, you know, old and, you know, close to dying and they're talking about their life regrets and it's never, oh, I wish I worked more mm-hmm. <laughs> like that. That is not at the top of anybody's list. It, it's usually more family based. So I, I don't want to be one of those people with that regret. So I, I knew I was going to be backing off of trading and I have, um, I, I was, I was really trading very actively for the first six months of 2020. Um, that was kind of about the end for me, um, which was a lot of the pandemic early craze stuff. And it was, it was awesome. Like I, I had a record year in six months, which was, you can't, I mean, I think a lot of people did, honestly, like, I'm, I'm not that special, but um it was still uh, it was still a lot of fun to trade in that environment. And then during that time, I was starting to experiment a little bit with some algo trading. Uh, we I, I was down in Puerto Rico and had met somebody who had done a lot of coding with crypto. And so I asked them, like, I, I just kind of had this idea in my head because I had an IRA account, a Roth account that I wasn't using. And I, uh, I was thinking like, huh, maybe we could like, automate some super simple long strategy in here just to like have it doing something. And so it it started off just like that. Like where it was like, Oh, let's just put something really simple together. Like, you know, something that like maybe buys a NASDAQ runner and looks for a gap up the next day and just sells it at open, you know, and uh, maybe I can make a couple percent per trade on average and just slowly grow it that way. And so we got that all figured out. And then as that's happening, I'm watching all these crazy breakout runners from all the pandemic action. And you know, my wheels are turning and I start asking him like, okay, like, can we maybe try to automate you know, breakouts or afternoon breakouts? And uh, it just kind of snowballed from there where we just started trying to put strategies into code. And uh, it, uh, I mean, that's, that's really been the main focus the last couple of years. And it's been great because it's something I can work on outside of market hours. So I'm, I'm there during the day when my kids are awake and then late at night when I'm usually awake by myself, that's when I can try to work on some coding logic or strategy automation logic. That's exciting. I mean, first of all, congratulations on becoming a father. That's, I can imagine yeah. that's, Thanks. I can imagine that's quite a bit of, of change in terms of what your normal trading routine and schedule might be like in the mornings. It, it is. Yeah. You know, we, we had, we had my, uh, we had my first son when um, I was doing that six months of trading in 2020. And it was hilarious because I, you know, I've got my three screens in front of me and one screen has like, you know, cocoa melon videos or something on it. And he's like sitting on my lap watching cocoa melon while I'm trying to like trade a little bit. So it, it was a juggling act, but it was, it was definitely fun. What's your typical, if there is even a typical morning routine like these days and how different is that from maybe when you were first starting uh, your trading career. I don't know if you were at the desk and, you know, for the full trading day uh, early on in your career, but how different is that to your your time at the desk these days? Yeah. I mean, yeah. So I, I guess I never totally answered the second half of your question earlier, which is like my trading more these days. Like, yes, I'm focused on automation, but as far as my personal trading, I'm doing almost none. Um, I like, I will, I will every now and then take a random long trade, like in my E-Trade account or something. Um, But I'm doing almost no short selling just because I'm kind of afraid to not be in front of the screen if I'm short something. Whereas for a long, it's a lot easier for me to just throw on stop and walk away. Um, So I got got a little active back in March when all the oil stuff was going nuts. And I actually had a pretty good couple of weeks um, longing some oil stocks. But other than that, I've been fairly inconsistent with my longs. And honestly, I'm not really putting the time in. I'm not really uh, doing a great job of uh, following rules in all cases. Um, I've, I've had some good wins on the longs. I've had some bad losses where it's like, oh, okay, yeah, I let that one get away from me. Um, but I'm not, I'm not engaged in the process like I should be. I think I'm just more looking for a little bit of action. Um, so morning routine now, there's almost nothing trading related about it. Um, I, you know, I'm up, I'm helping you know, the kids you know, get dressed, eat breakfast. Um, now we, we have recently gotten them both in daycare in the mornings. 
So, um, you know, mornings could be more open to me again for a little more trading if I decide I want to dive back in. So I'm thinking about that for 2023 and what I want my mornings to look like. If I want to, uh, you know, be one of those guys who maybe shorts for the first hour, hour and a half of the day and then throws and stops and walks away. Um, but yeah, really, like if, if I have any kind of routine related to trading now, it's just, hey, when I got a spare minute, let's throw up a scanner and see what's moving and just take a quick look at it. Maybe throw up dilution tracker, make sure it's not too diluted and take a stab long if I like the pattern. That's that's really interesting. I think one of the things as traders that, you know, you have an opportunity to do is step away from the desk and spend more time doing, you know, living life, uh, which I think is what a lot of people get into trading to be able to do uh, anyways. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. The whole, uh, what's the phrase it's um, trade to live, don't live to trade. Absolutely. It seems like you've been able to find a balance um, where you still get to trade when you want to trade and then you get to enjoy life and, and spend time with the family as well. So I think that's that's really great to, to hear and a, a good perspective um, from you know a trader over the course of, of years and how their life might change. Mm -hmm, yeah. And you you mentioned the the algorithmic trading as well. So I definitely wanted to ask some questions on on that front sure, as, yeah. as well. Um, so are you when you're um, trading for or rather building out algorithms? Um, you know, how much of this are you doing yourself versus I know you you had mentioned um, you you met someone who who sort of helped you with algorithms. Um, are you learning to code? Are you implementing um, or having somebody else implement some of your discretionary trading strategies or, you know, in general, what's what's the algorithm algorithmic side uh, looking like for you? Yeah, so here, here's how that all works. Um, basically, I, I learned a little bit of coding a few years ago, um, but that was more just to automate a few of my spreadsheets. It was nothing I could carry over to this. It was just too complicated. Um, so rather than taking the time to learn coding way in depth, um, you know, I was already friends with this guy. So I, I hired him to do all of the coding side for me. And my, my side of the operation was, okay, I'm going to try to provide the trading rules, the logic. And... Um, I, I have very mixed feelings about how it's gone so far. Um, it's, you know, profitability wise in two years, it's made close to $900,000. So it's, uh, it's profitable, like it's a success in that way. Um, but if I really take a step back and look at it and how it trades and kind of the rules it follows, it, I feel a little like queasy. I'm just like, oh, I don't, I don't like how that operates. So, like I need to change some of the rules on this. Um, a big, big challenge for me throughout this whole thing is that I have always thought of myself as a pretty systematic trader just because, you know, I, I know my setups, I name my setups, I kind of know what I'm looking for. And I, I've really struggled at time getting some of the stuff into code. Um, there, there's a lot more discretionary elements to what I do than I had originally realized. Um, like where, like, you know, we, we'd be doing the breakout longs was one of the first one setups we put into play. And I, I would watch a breakout long fire. And it, it was really funny how I'd have these gut reactions to it. Where it's like, oh, I really like this one. And or like, oh, I'm not so sure about that one. And I couldn't really put my finger on like where that feeling was coming from. Um, and and it showed in the performance, like the breakouts were very market dependent, to be honest. Like early 2021 they made i mean even then they, they made like 900k in two months in january and february of 2021 and then they bled away most of those gains over the next six to eight months and i, I kind of let it do that which i probably shouldn't have but i was kind of just taking the like oh it's the algos it doesn't matter mindset i, I was thinking like oh the market will kind of stabilize eventually and uh yeah so then i had to really dig in and try to figure out like why why are these not as consistent as it would be if I was the person trading it. Like, wait, where's the disconnect here? And that is still something I struggle with. I mean, you know, we're doing longs and shorts now. Um, I'm kind of going through similar issues with the short strategies. Um, the shorts are outperforming the longs for sure. And I think it kind of, I've, I've always said, I think shorts are a much easier setup to trade than longs because shorts are, you know, you're, you're waiting for something to get really extended. You're waiting for the trade to come to you, so to speak. Whereas longs, it's a lot more predictive. 
Like which one of these runners is really going to run? Um, so yeah, there, there, there's definitely some disconnect between, um, what an algo does and the rules I put in place for it versus what I see when I look at a chart and, uh, part of the journey of trying to figure that out and untangle that is, uh, looking at new technicals, new indicators, whatever I can, um, especially for exiting trades. That's always been my weak point. Like that, that's been like entirely discretionary for me trade by trade. And I know it. Like, when do I think it's time to sell? When do I think it's time to cover? And if I can't even really define that, you know, in my process, how am I going to put that in code? So, uh, yeah, you know, it, it, I'm still working on it. I'm thankful that it's been profitable so far, but um, I, I need to also really stop and think about my goals with it because it's, it's my goal to just make a little extra money on the side with the algos, or is my goal to make these things as crazy and badass as I can, and they'll just do all the trading for me for the rest of my life, you know? So it's, uh, it's, it's a process, but it's a fun, it's a fun challenge. It definitely is a fun challenge. Do you have any advice for traders who might be interested in getting started with algorithmic trading? Is there anything that you would, you would like them to know ahead of time or, or maybe, you know, maybe that it's baby steps to start. Where would you? Yeah, I, I can think of a couple things. Um, so, I mean, one, one thing I will mention is that um, I, I did go through um, Matty Owens, uh, Triforce Traders course um, about like kind of like handling data and like you know, proper ways to, uh, you know, back test and, you know, splitting your data into training set versus test set and all that stuff. Um, so that was, that was helpful for sure. Um, Although he might be, he might be winding down his service. I'm not sure now, but um, it was, it was, it was definitely cool to go through that. Um, as far as like advice for early starting and like, especially some of the mistakes I've made, um, like one of, one of the big problems I think that I had early on, especially with the longs was that we didn't have good back testing in place. So I would, I would be collecting data at the end of every day. We, we kind of automated that process. But when I was trying to refine my, breakout strategies initially, you know, I was really only using market data from this period of time where the market was really, really hot. And so, you know, the, the obvious problem there is that when the market is not hot, well, that's entirely new to the system and it's seen nothing like that before. And so it, it kind of makes sense that my results dropped off so sharply on the longs. So I would say you definitely need to uh, have like years of back testing data um, because that will help you build a more robust system. And, uh, you know, one, one thing that I'm considering and that I think could be a very um, useful approach is even splitting the data based on, you know, how hot or cold the market is, but then you gotta find a way to measure that. So again, it goes back to that thing of like, how complicated do you really wanna make it? Like, do you wanna try to build a one size fits all markets approach? Or do you want to have different rules in place for when you know nothing's really gapping versus when there's tons of stuff gapping? Um, so yeah, the the, the good the good back testing data is is huge, and that is something that we just got in place on our end in the last six months or so, and uh, that did that did start to really help with the short performance. Um, that that that's one that's really one of the main things I can think of is just just be able to back test. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I think that's extremely useful advice. Um, and so I, I wanted to ask you, you know, more, more generally speaking, as you look back at uh, your trading career so far, um, you know, your trajectory kind of has some similarities to what a lot of new traders um, might be doing. You know, they might save up some extra money, they might trade, they might lose, they come back, um, but you found success. And so when you look back on your trading career, what do you think were some of the, you know, contributing factors um, that allowed you to succeed? And, you know, do you think it would be any more difficult or perhaps easier um, to start trading in the modern times, 2020, 2022, and find success? Yeah, that's a good question. I do think, I do think it'd be harder now. I really do. Um, because a big, a big catalyst for my early account growth was those pump and dumps where they, they can shoot up so fast, so quickly. So, um, you know, that, that was, it's not like that was all of my gains, but it sure helped me get over that pattern day trader hump a lot quicker. Um, so not to, to not really have those anymore. Um, you know, 
for me personally, it would be tough because I, I think I'm much weaker of a long trader than a short trader. And I think if you're starting now, you've almost certainly got to start looking for longs because short selling, there's just so many barriers to entry uh, and so many more fees too. Um, so if I dove in today as a new trader and I was trying to figure out longs, um, you know, my, my attention would definitely be like on lower float stuff. It would be on, you know, daily gappers, whatever has momentum. Um, but I, I mean, man, I, I don't know exactly what approach I would take to be honest with you. Again, I'd probably just go straight to data and trying to track stuff and just figure out some kind of long edge that I can exploit. Um, now, factors that I think also played a role early in my success, even after I blew up. Uh, the, one of the big ones is that I did cut down um, a lot of the extra stuff I was doing. You know, I, I went from trying to trade eight setups to trying to trade two setups that I felt like I understood the best, that I felt like I was the most consistent with. Um, I, I really didn't pay attention to what everybody else was doing. I paid attention to what I needed to do based off of, you know, what, like where my comfort was, where my success was. And that could definitely be hard on days where your setup is not there and you're watching everybody else trade some hot mover and, you know, everyone's like calling out like, oh, boom, I nailed it in the chat room and stuff like that. That's, that's hard to ignore. Um, also, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but again, just when you're, when you're struggling, putting the blame on yourself, not, not blaming external factors, but figuring out where in your own process you're going wrong. Um, I, I, I was honest with myself. I held myself accountable. I didn't, I didn't look to blame the evil shorty or the manipulative market makers. Um, you know, I'm the one pushing the buttons. I need to figure out how to push them at better times. So uh, I think the last thing I could really touch on would be um, like, you know, I, I blew up and I wasn't discouraged because I, I had other ideas of what to try. I, I, I kind of was able to recognize where I had gone wrong. Like I bled out most of my first 1500 trying to short sell. And I was like, why am I trying to short sell right now? I obviously don't have a good understanding of this. Whereas, you know, longs I had some success. So maybe I should just pay attention to that. Um, that there were all these other ideas I still had to explore too. Um, so it's not like I blew up and I was like, well, I have no idea what I did wrong. Like, where do I go from here? Like I, I didn't refund my account, keep trying the same thing. I refunded my account and I made adjustments. So if you do blow up and you don't really know where you went wrong, I would say take a little time, you know, if, try, try to get to the root of the issue before you put any more money in the market. I think that's great advice, particularly about taking personal responsibility. You know, as traders, we are discretionary traders. We're the ones pressing the buttons. And so, you know, if we take a big, big loss, it's up to us to evaluate where we did something wrong and how to get better. Um, and on that, that sort of topic, you know, how did you deal, how did you deal with um, some of these big losses that you had? You know, was it exactly what, what you were saying is, you know, go back, find out where you did something wrong and, um, and, and fix it. You know, has there been any losses where even in addition, you just had to take some time off and, and walk away? Yeah. So that, that was, that was just different in the sense that it was, well, first of all, I, it was, it all, it all came from a bad habit that I got away with for six months where I just, I transitioned from OTZs to NASDAQs and I immediately said, oh, NASDAQs are way choppier. I, I think I need to adjust my approach. So I got more reluctant to stop out right, right out of the gate, which was just a bad, a bad way to get started with listed stocks. And then um, I went on some rides where I would, I would not stop out. I'd be down 50 K and then I'd eventually be able to close out the trade for a break key or like only lose a thousand dollars or two. And I, I, like I said, this was like six months this went on and I never got burned. And I, I, I specifically remember one where I was down like six figures on a short that closed at its highs of the day. And I carried it overnight and I was just like, oh my gosh, like, what if this gaps up tomorrow? And thank goodness it gapped down and it crashed. But, you know, like I just, I kept getting, you know, positive reward for this bad habit. And then I think that's what made it so hard to break because, you know, when I take the $290,000 loss on Lake and that was the first one that happened to me where I did really just get, you know, destroyed, um, th there was no trouble saying what went wrong. Like, 
learned. It was like, okay, yeah, I got really stubborn. I fought, I added against, you know, I, I added outside of my plan. Um, but where, where the real challenge came in was when I thought it was okay, well, lesson learned, but then I just fell right back into old habits and it happened again three months later. And then it happened again three months later. And that was where it started to get really scary for me and um, really uncomfortable because at that point it wasn't um, it wasn't so much about like what's the problem with um, my trading like I, I knew it was wrong with my trading it's what's the problem with me like why am I not making the adjustment why can't I get over you know these stubborn tendencies and uh, and after after each one of those big losses I would have to take time off I would I would give myself like about a week away and just try to refresh and clear my head because it was emotionally damaging to take the loss too. And I didn't want to slip into revenge trading where I would show up the next day after a big loss and throw crazy size of stuff. Um, I, I did that after Lake. After, after Lake, I, uh, I tried to trade for a couple more days. It, it was just super uncharacteristic trading and I could see it where I was just so reckless. And that, that's kind of where the rule came from, where it was like, okay, like I'm going to get myself into even more trouble. So I better just like get, get a clear head and get back to, you know, the fundamentals of what I do. But uh, yeah, it, it was, uh, it was really that tear myself down process and uh, make that mistake journal and hold myself accountable and earn the right to rebuild size that really undid it all. And that was a month long process. I heard you mention a, a mistake journal. So is that something that that really enforced you know and, and reinforced some of these these bad habits and turned them into good habits and and as part of that like mistake journal did you um, develop any particular rules for for managing risk and and adapting your trades yeah so it, it um I don't feel like I really had to make any new rules you know like the, the rule of any short I took really was like I should be stopping out by high a day of the latest depending on what my plan is so that didn't so much change but you know the, the mistake journal the the big ones I remember from my mistake journal um, were that either I played it too large from the start I failed to cut a loser or I um, you know I would be in a stubborn situation where it got you know outside of my risk level and then I would start adding and that, that was the big one. That was, that was the commonality of all of my large losses was not only had I gotten stubborn, but I'd also been adding outside of my plan and really let the size get out of control against me. Um, so, so yeah, it was, it was possible, you know, to make all three mistakes in the same trade. Um, so, so yeah, the, the journal was supposed to be, you know, accountability because um, I, I, I talked, I, I realized that even early in my career, you know, perception versus reality, um, you know, can be very different things. So I wanted to get it down on a sheet somewhere where I actually had a physical tally. And it wasn't just at the end of the month, I would be thinking back and saying, oh, I feel like I did well. Like I could actually look at the numbers and see, did I do well or not? Um, so uh, I, you know, I, I stopped, I stopped doing the mistake journal towards the end of the process. Um, one, one thing I would do if I was struggling in one area in particular, like, like a big one was just cutting the loss. Um, you know, if, if my stop came and went and I didn't stop out, um, if, if I really felt like I was having trouble with that, I would put hard stops in for a week. Um, I, I never liked using hard stops in my trading. I liked using you know mental stops and just firing it through myself when it came along. So if, if I took a couple stubborn ones in a row. Yeah. I would just be go to hard stops, use hard stops for a week, get myself back in the habit of, you know, not canceling that stop order and walking it trigger and take me out of the trade. And now, okay, fresh start. I can get back in if it takes me out. Um, but I, I, I usually, after just a week of hard stops, we go back to mental stops and then be right back on track and be able to do things like I was supposed to. Is there one particular like trade that really had a huge impact on on you and the way that you your career um, trajectory went. If I think about like a good trade and the way my career trajectory went, it might be that first pump that I really nailed out of the gate, where it was like a, a, like an awesome penny stocks promotion. I think it was AMWI got announced at about seven cents or nine cents or something like that, and I was able to load it up really quick. And Within seven minutes, I sold it for $2,700 gain. And I remember that one just like, you know, like it, it took me from like break even to profitable after my blow up. 
And I was like jumping around my apartment. I was like so pumped up and excited. And I was like, yes, like I, I've got this now. Um, so that was, that was really probably like the most excited I've ever been from a trade. Um, and the wins over the years have gotten less and less exciting. Um, that, that almost is a problem sometimes where it's like, I want to chase that high kind of, and, uh, and find a way to feel really good after a win. And it's like, well, what number is big enough to do that anymore? And, and so sometimes, and that, that's where I'll slip into the reward first mentality, which is where I get in trouble on a lot of my trades, where I go into a trade saying, oh, well, I want to make X amount on this instead of, oh, how much am I willing to lose if I'm wrong? So, uh, yeah, the, the, the wins have gotten less exciting over the years. Uh, the, the only other standout trade I can really think of would be Fannie Mae, um, which was, I think it was 2014. Um, I, I'm having trouble remembering the exact year now, but that's just one of the most perfect OTC, you know, spikes and collapses and bounces you could ever ask for. Like, you know, waterfall of red candles, spike of nothing but green candles. And that was a $200,000 a day for me very early in my career, um, which, you know, that, that really boosted growth off of the back of that. So um, that, that also was a very exciting day. It didn't quite match the excitement of AMWI, but I remember just being like, you know, like shaking and like, you know, both exhausted and like adrenalized at the same time. Like it was just such an intense day. Um, I think the losses have honestly done a lot more for me in terms of helping me with my career though, um, because it's, you know, it's having to adapt and learn from them. And just, you know, even the fact that I had to put myself through that whole mistake journal and rebuilding my thighs, like I I've made most of my gains as a trader after that happened. Um, like that, and that's no coincidence. Like once I finally got my risk management under control like that, that kind of took me to the next level. And uh, yeah, I, I think the lessons and the losers are a lot better than, um, you know, kind of the good feeling and reward you get from the winners. It, it sounds like maybe that, that first winner was kind of like a confirmation that maybe you could do this. Is that? Mm-hmm. Kind yeah, of yeah, definitely. And it was so great to like get over that hump after the account blow up to, yeah. uh, you know, finally be profitable. Yeah. That's, that's excellent. Um, and if it's okay with you, Tim, I'd love to be able to go through sort of like a lightning round uh, set of questions, just quick questions and, and quick answers, if that's okay with you. Yeah, okay, sure. Great. Uh, so my first question is, you know, what do you consider to be your greatest strength as a trader? Uh, greatest strength, I think I would say play selection. And I think that that's been kind of uh, reinforced with some of this algo experimenting I've been doing where... You know, I, I can look at the algo, take a trade and have such a quick gut reaction to like, oh, is this is like, do I like this or do I not like this you know, for the algo right now? Um, so so I think that, yeah, my patience and selectivity has got to be the, the key. And what's the best advice you ever received from another trader? Um, you know, th- th- this is more general because... Um, it just kind of was said to everybody, I think, but, you know, I, I love Nate's saying trade the ticker, not the company. Um, because I, I, you know, very early had to figure out like, especially in the OTC market, like all these press releases, all these great stories, like they're just bullshit. Like I, I, I would, I would feel really sad seeing people get sucked in by what the story is. Whereas I was still always trying to trade the price action. If you could go back and give yourself one piece of advice, what do you think you would tell yourself? And do you think that you would heed that advice and, and apply it? It would kind of center around not getting complacent. Cause I think, I think, you know, like I said, I, it was kind of a conscious adjustment when I went to NASDAQ. It's like, Oh, I think I need to maybe play a little bit looser of risks because they're so choppy. Um, but I definitely got very complacent and comfortable in my success. And that was part of what led me down that road of not stopping out, like uh, maybe a little bit of ego there. Um, so I think I would be trying to tell myself, like, you know, even if you think you've made it, like you haven't made it, like the market will always find a way to humble you. So, you know, make sure you stick to your rules and don't get sloppy with any of them because just because you're successful, that doesn't mean anything tomorrow. And would I listen? I probably wouldn't. I'm, I'm, I'm generally a, uh, I need to get burned to, uh, internalize something. What is your favorite scanning tool? Uh, I've always used scans. 
Um, and I, I just like using percent gainers really. Um, and some kind of like minimum volume filter um, to make sure I'm not picking up really illiquid stuff. But uh, yeah, that, that's all I've ever looked at in my scanners is what's up on the day and let's sort them by how much they're up and then just flip through some daily charts and see what jumps out. And do you have any favorite technical indicators that you use on your charts? Uh, I've always used VWAP on my charts. Um, I, I don't usually make decisions around it in terms of like, oh, it just cracked below VWAP, so now I'm going to short. I've always kind of used it more as a guideline. Like, where is the stock consolidating above or below VWAP? Kind of who's trapped right now, the longs or the shorts? Um, but beyond that, I've never used too many advanced indicators. I, I did mention earlier I'm experimenting with a bunch right now, but I haven't really found anything that's jumped out at me yet that I super love. And what advice would you give to struggling traders? Um, I mean, the biggest I think is keep your size small, keep yourself in the game because, um, you know, you need it to be a recoverable amount of money early. Everybody's going to make mistakes. Even if you start off succeeding, you're still going to make mistakes at some point in the journey. Um, let those be recoverable. Like if I had been a $5,000 or $10,000 account when I first started instead of $1,500, I think it would have been one and done for me. I don't think I would have been back. And uh, that would have been that would have been really sad. So, so give yourself a chance to learn from your mistakes. And what types of noise do you think traders should filter out and how could they better be focused? It's got to be the uh, probably... Mostly Twitter, you know, people posting their execution charts at the end of the day. Like it always seems like we're posting the execution charts of our winners, right? And uh, that that's just not useful. I, I I don't get much from execution charts personally. I can't look at somebody's execution chart where they've probably taken all of the useful indicators they use off of the chart already, and try to put myself in their head and say, oh, what were they thinking there? Like it's just it's just looking at this gain and then. I, I also, I, I have a lot of trouble with, um, you know, just worrying about what other traders are doing instead of worrying about myself. Um, I, I had to deal with that earlier in my career where I would have a couple thousand dollar day and that'd be awesome for me at the time. And then I might see somebody else on Twitter that posted a $10,000 day and all of a sudden feel like, oh, I didn't do enough. When in reality, I was right where I needed to be in the process. Um, even now, like I, I think I... I still have a little bit of like a, like, oh, like every good trader is making $50 million a year and I'm not like, what's wrong with me? And it's like, that's, that's not where, that's not useful. Like focus on yourself. Don't focus on everybody else. What are some of the trading related goals or just goals in general uh, for you moving forward? What's the, what's the future of Tim Gratani looking like? It's funny. I'm, I'm at a little bit of a crossroads. I'm not totally sure. I, like I said, my kids have been in daycare for a couple of months now. I, I could be trading mornings again if I wanted to be, but I'm not. Like I, I don't have a huge itch to be back at it myself right now. Um, right now, I think my main focus is trying to get past that challenge of the algos. Like I'd love to get something a little bit more robust in place that trades a little bit more true to my style. And uh, yeah, I, I like the challenge of it. I like the idea of having something that can trade for me so I don't have to be glued to the screens. Um, but, you know, down the road, I, I think I'd still like to always be involved in the market to some degree personally. So I think it's just finding the right balance where I don't feel like I need to be all in or all out. And for anybody listening, uh, how can they best get a hold of you or learn more about you and your trading style? Um, I'm, I'm not too accessible these days, unfortunately. Um, I, I don't really do any kind of social media direct messaging. Um, I'm hopeful that most of you know by now that if you see a Tim Gratani account reach out to you, you know it's a scammer and it's not really me. There's a lot of imposters out there um, for like any big trader, really. Um, as far as learning about my style, like trading tickers, trading tickers two, those are both courses that I made where I tried to really outline, you know, step by step, you know, what my process is on different setups, um, you know, just what I did to make myself successful. Um, that's not to say it's what you should do. It's just what worked for me. And I tried to teach it. Well, those are all the questions that I had, Tim. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. It's been an absolute honor. It's been a pleasure to get to talk to you. Yeah. Thanks again. It's been great being on. If you liked this video, don't forget to hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell. Thanks for watching.